This is Neuropathology Smears and Frozen Sections. Let's start off with some learning objectives. After this lecture, I would like you to understand the pathologist's role in evaluating craniotomy specimens and stereotactic biopsies. I would like for you to know the difference or be able to differentiate between gliosis and a low-grade glioma on both smears and frozen sections. I would like you to know the criteria for diagnosing a high-grade glioma intraoperatively. I would like you to know how to recognize specific pediatric gliomas, in particular pilocytic astrocytoma and dependymoma, and also to know the key patterns of metastatic carcinoma, meningioma, lymphoma, and medulloblastoma. So what are the reasons for neurosurgical intraoperative consultations? Well, the reasons vary. It could be to establish the presence of diagnostic tissue. That's one of the more important reasons. It could be satisfying curiosity. It could be for providing a preliminary diagnosis for the family and patient or using that preliminary diagnosis to help set up appointments with radiation oncology and neuro-oncology and so on or it may be for the purposes of triaging the tissue in, in the event that additional studies are necessary, such as flow cytometry, molecular studies, and cultures. So for craniotomy specimens, the neurosurgeon is generally confirming that the lesion is what they think it is. They generally have a good idea based on radiology. And in most cases, what we say does not change the surgery. So whether it's a metastatic carcinoma or high-grade glioma, metastatic melanoma, any, any number of tumor types, the goal for them is a gross total resection. What diagnosis may change the procedure is hematopoietic lesions or non-neoplastic lesions that they thought were tumors. So if it turned out to be an abscess, they wouldn't have to do a gross total resection. If it's lymphoma, they don't have to do a gross total resection, et cetera. But for the vast majority of tumor types that we see, what we say doesn't change the surgery. So if you're not sure, you just say malignant epithelial neoplasm or malignant glioma, etc. For stereotactic biopsies in general, they're making sure that they're in the lesion and that diagnostic tissue is present. You don't have to have a specific diagnosis. You just need to make sure that what you're saying or what you think it is correlates with radiology. So for a stereotactic biopsy, a specific diagnosis is not necessary, but rather you want to communicate to the neurosurgeon that what you see jives with what they think it is or what the radiologist thinks that the tumor is and that they correlate. For example, if you saw a tumor and it looked like a low-grade glioma, but radiologically it was a ring-enhancing lesion, even though it's lesional, it's not necessarily diagnostic because it doesn't correlate with the imaging. Another important point when you receive a specimen from a neurosurgeon, always assume that you may not get additional material. So do not, in general, freeze all of the tissue unless the tissue doesn't have a lesion in it and you have to sample it further. You want to maintain some non-frozen tissue because the process of freezing will introduce artifacts. And also, the tissue that you freeze is often lost, or at least some of it is lost after tissue processing. Now on to techniques and the advantages and disadvantages of each of these two techniques. For the intraoperative assessment of a brain tumor, essentially you have two tools, smears and frozen sections. Some places will do smears only, while others will do frozen sections only, but most neuropathologists use a combination of both smears and frozen sections. So what are the advantages of doing smears? The principal advantage is that it provides vastly superior cytologic detail. It's fast and it consumes very little tissue. In fact, it doesn't take much tissue to get a good smear. The disadvantage is that it's a small sample size, so sampling could be an issue. The tissue is spent in the sense that once you smear that tissue, there's not much else you can do with it. You can't do IHC, you can't do molecular studies. Although in theory, you could scrape it off. For the most part, that tissue is, is no longer usable. Also, there's a lack of architecture or any sense of the interface with the brain tissue. And also variability in thickness. So if you smear too much tissue, it may smear so dense that it overestimates cellularity. 
and sometimes it's so dense you can't make out cytologic details because they're essentially three-dimensional uh, clusters of cells. Frozen sections, the major advantage is that it has superior architectural detail in contrast to the cytologic detail of smears. You also get a good sense of the brain tumor interface if there is brain tissue in there and you get a broader sample so it's a it's a better sampling of the tissue that was sent the disadvantage is it takes longer it consumes more tissue and it introduces artifact into that tissue as far as the technique smears essentially involve taking a very small portion of the tissue generally maybe a millimeter of tissue or so not much placing it on a slide and then using two slides to smear that tissue across the slides after which you immediately fix it you don't want to air dry it and then you stain it with H&E the of course the frozen section technique is the technique of the usual frozen section nothing special my approach to the intraoperative consultations essentially first you want to start with examining the tissue if it's a craniotomy specimen to make sure that the lesion is sampled sometimes there's normal brain and then number two, you examine the slides and you interpret the lesion without bias, meaning I generally go in with no knowledge of clinical history, radiology. I'm just looking at the tissue and interpreting it in, in that context without bias. Now it's okay to ask for patient age and location, but I generally personally think it's best to go in without too much bias. Now many people disagree with me, but I've been doing it that way for a long time and it's worked out well. Then after you've examined the tissue and come up with a diagnosis, then you go to the, the clinical report and you look up the imaging and make sure that the, your interpretation correlates with the radiology. If it does, you communicate that final assessment to the surgeon. So here basically is the algorithm. You sample the lesion or the surgeon samples the lesion. You examine the slides and you classify the lesion after classifying the lesion, you correlate it with the imaging. If it correlates, you call in the diagnosis. If there's a lack of correlation, then you probably need more sampling. Now that could be you sampling the tissue they sent, or it may require that you call them and say, essentially this is non-diagnostic, we need more tissue. It is generally said that radiological imaging is basically the gross examination for brain tumors. Because there's not much you can say when you look at an actual specimen. They're generally hemorrhagic and necrotic. And there's nothing in particular about the gross specimen that's going to help you with the differential. But imaging is, is very important. So the first concept to understand with imaging is the concept of intraaxial versus extraaxial. Now this is neuroradiology speak. And in terms of correlating that to the pathologist, intraaxial means intraparenchymal and extraaxial means outside of the CNS parenchyma. So an intraaxial tumor is a tumor that resides within the CNS parenchyma. That's the brain or spinal cord. And extraaxial is by and large dural-based lesions. Next is the concept of enhancing versus non-enhancing. So for most of these patients, when they do imaging, and it's generally going to be an MRI, they give them a contrast agent that helps determine whether or not a tumor is enhancing or non-enhancing. So what does that imply? If a tumor enhances, to me that implies it does not have a normal blood-brain barrier, doesn't have a normal CNS vascular supply. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily neoplastic or malignant. It just gives you a sense of the permeability of the vasculature of that lesion. While in general, non-enhancing lesions still retain an intact blood-brain barrier, so that enhancing compound, which is gadolinium, is not able to get across the blood-brain barrier in the lesion, therefore will be non-enhancing. This slide just emphasizes the difference between intraaxial and extraaxial. To remind you, intraaxial means within the CNS parenchyma, and extraaxial means outside of the CNS parenchyma, by and large dural-based. So the differential diagnosis is going to vary between these two. Intraaxial, the differential diagnosis is gliomas, metastases, which are carcinomas and melanomas, CNS lymphoma, and embryonal tumors, and we'll talk more about that later, basically primitive tumors. While extraaxial tumors, by and large, are meningiomas because they're dural-based, 
but you can also get metastatic tumors that are extraaxial. Peripheral nerve sheath tumors like schwannomas are also extraaxial. And sarcomas that involve the brain are generally extraaxial as well. In terms of correlating with the imaging findings, the concept of enhancing versus non-enhancing can actually be very helpful. Most of your malignant high-grade tumors enhance, and in fact, the most common pattern of enhancement is so-called ring enhancement, where you have a dark central area of the tumor and an enhancing pattern around that dark area, where the dark area represents necrosis and the nodular areas of enhancement represent viable tumor. In contrast, most, although not all, of your low-grade intraaxial tumors do not enhance. And we'll talk about that exception later, but essentially some of your very low grade, your grade one tumors of the pediatric population are enhancing tumors. So you need to understand that if it can be different if you're dealing with a pediatric population. So this concept of low grade tumors non-enhancing is generally an adult concept. So tumors that enhance include high grade gliomas, metastatic tumors of all types, metastatic carcinoma, metastatic melanoma, CNS lymphoma, and brinal tumors, i.e. medulloblastoma. And the, the two that I highlight here are two examples of tumors that enhance but are not malignant, and that includes pilocytic astrocytoma, again a pediatric glioma, and meningioma, but this is extraaxial, and most of your extraaxial tumors actually enhance. And then your non-enhancing tumors include your low-grade gliomas, generally your adult low-grade gliomas, and a reactive gliosis lesion would also be non-enhancing. I created this simple diagram just to kind of walk you through how you can think about a case that you come across on a, in terms of intraoperative frozen section. The first thing you want to decide, is it normal or abnormal? Because sometimes you're going to get tissue where they miss the lesion and it may actually be normal. Now that's not very common, and if that happens, you need more tissue. In general, if it's abnormal, you need to decide, is it reactive, is it neoplastic, or is it inflammatory? The vast majority of the specimens that we get are neoplastic, so then you wanna, you wanna subtype the neoplastic tumor into glial, epithelial, and I often say epithelioid, because not everything that looks epithelial is epithelial, i.e. melanoma, meningothelial, hematopoietic, and brinal, and of course other, because sometimes things don't fit into these broad categories. So let's walk through this. First, if it's normal, obviously you need more tissue. Now that could be they sent you a craniotomy specimen and you sampled the wrong area, or it could be that they just sent you outside of the lesion and they, they need to get more. Typically, you're gonna have a specimen that looks abnormal. It doesn't look like normal brain tissue. And then you need to decide, it, could it be reactive? Is it neoplastic? And could it be inflammatory? If it is reactive, the most common pattern of reactive brain is it going to involve glial cells. And we call this reactive gliosis. Now remember the types of glial cells. You have astrocytes, you have oligodendroglial cells, you have ependymal cells, and you have microglia. Microglia, of course, are macrophages. And astrocytes are the most important, the most numerous cell of the brain, and they're the most important in terms of this process of reactive gliosis. So reactive gliosis refers to reactive change within glial cells in response to injury. The most prominent and the most well-described reaction is that of the astrocytes they become uh, more prominent histologically in the sense that their cytoplasm becomes more copious. It becomes more eosinophilic as it accumulates GFAP. And you'll often see their little processes ex extending to the capillaries because they're in there to try to help form this blood-brain barrier, maintain that barrier against external threats. So with reactive gliosis, you may see an increase in the number of glial cells but if they are increased, causing this mild in increase in cellularity, they still tend to be relatively uniform in their spacing, meaning they don't crowd together. And if, if they are causing an increase cell in cellularity, it's mild at most. So here's a smear, and this smear shows a typical pattern of, of gliosis. So the cellularity is a little elevated. It's more than you would typically see in normal brain. 
But what stands out are these cells, like you can see here in the middle, and a couple over here. These are reactive astrocytes. Notice that they have much more copious cytoplasm, this pink cytoplasm, and you can make out the little processes that are being extended to capillaries, helping to maintain the blood-brain barrier. Also notice the nuclear details. They tend to have nice uniform nuclear membranes. The chromatin's not dark. It's not coarse or clumpy. It tends to have, have relatively light staining nucleus. And again, abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm and even spacing, even on a smear, they tend to be relatively spaced out. Now we move from reactive to neoplastic and we'll walk through our differential diagnosis by looking at each of the cell types. By far the most common primary brain tumor is gonna be a glioma. And so these are tumors that derive from glial cells or their precursors. So remember your main types of glial cells, you have astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, ependymal cells, and microglia. I put microglia in red once again because they are macrophages and they do not form tumors within the brain, or at least not any sort of common tumor. So most of the gliomas that you're going to see derive from astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, or ependymal cells. And they form astrocytomas, oligodendrogliomas, and ependymomas. So again, your main categories of glioma, astrocytoma, oligodendroglioma, ependymoma, and there are mixed gliomas, but these have fallen out of favor, so I would kind of let that go. And so let's talk a little bit more about glioma subtypes. So first, I would say you have to look at it in terms of adults versus children because the more common tumor types are very different in these two. And adults, the vast majority of the gliomas are going to be of the infiltrative type. In other words, they permeate the brain and they're generally of astrocytic or oligodendroglial origin. Astrocytic origin is most common, but uh, you will run into many cases of oligodendroglial origin. And here's a key point with these gliomas. You do not need to differentiate between an astrocytoma in, in terms of infiltrating astrocytoma and an oligodendroglioma intraoperatively. Number one, it's very hard to do. Number two, it doesn't matter. So when you're looking at a, an adult glioma, you're just number one, establishing it as a glioma, and number two, deciding whether it's low grade or high grade. For children, most of the tumors fit into what is generally called circumscribed, or i.e. less infiltrative origin, and they're generally of astrocytic or ependymal origin histologically. These need to be recognized and subtyped intraoperatively if you can, because you need to let the surgeon know they need to excise the lesion, because for these two tumor types that we'll talk about, which is pilocytic astrocytoma and ependymoma, complete excision is the most important prognostic factor. So in terms of intraoperative diagnosis, the two most common glioma diagnoses that you'll give for an adult is gonna be high-grade glioma, low-grade glioma. Now, occasionally you'll just say glioma where you're not sure and give pertinent negatives. So you may say glioma, no evidence of necrosis or vascular proliferation. But in general, if you're able to correlate with the radiology, you can be specific and say high-grade glioma or low-grade glioma. For children, the most common glioma is going to be a pilocytic, pilocytic astrocytoma, then a pendymoma. But they can get, of course, diffuse gliomas. So you can make a diagnosis of low-grade glioma or high-grade glioma. Sometimes it's difficult to distinguish between a pilocytic and a low-grade glioma of the diffuse type or infiltrative type. And you can just give a diagnosis of low-grade glioma, but they're probably going to ask you whether or not you think that it's an ependymoma or pilocytic astrocytoma. And if you can't tell, then you just have to defer the diagnosis to permanence. Before we move on, let's talk a little bit more about the difference between normal, reactive, and a glioma, and in particular, low-grade glioma, because that can be difficult in some cases. What I would say is that from a histologic perspective, there is an overlap between normal and reactive brain. And on the other end of the spectrum, there is also an overlap histologically between reactive gliosis and a low-grade glioma. So if you put these together, 
you'll notice the most important factor is cellularity. And I would also throw in there cytologic details and nuclear atypia and so on, but that can be deceiving. So cellularity is probably one of the most key features of determining whether or not you're dealing with normal brain, reactive brain, or a low-grade glioma. In some cases, you're right on the fence between a pattern of reactive gliosis and low-grade glioma, essentially a situation where it's hard to tell whether or not it's a low-grade glioma definitively. And the most common diagnosis that you can give is mildly hypercellular brain tissue or mildly hypercellular glial tissue, and then tell them the differential includes gliosis versus a low-grade glioma. And the only way to di distinguish between these two is immunohistochemistry, molecular studies, and those sorts of things. But I find in the vast majority of cases, you can distinguish gliosis from a low-grade glioma. And let's run through some of the features that help you distinguish these two. And we'll first start with the pattern that you're gonna see on the smears. These two images represent smears. On the top is a smear of a case that turned out to be reactive gliosis. And on the bottom, a smear of a low-grade glioma. Notice the difference between the two. Notice how the reactive brain spreads out in a much different pattern than the low-grade glioma. I always say it has a sort of a diffuse pink appearance to it, especially if you look at the slide grossly. And that's because that neuropill kind of spreads out relatively even over the slide, while in a low-grade glioma, it has more of a clumpy appearance to it from low power. You're seeing more of that white space in the background. Here's another example, two different cases, same sort of pattern. Notice that sort of background pink staining that you see on gliosis and the more clumpy pattern that you see within a low-grade glioma. If you think it looks like gliotic or reactive brain on the smear, you go to higher power and you look for the reactive astrocytes, and those are gonna be the ones with abundant cytoplasm, bland nuclei, and relatively even spacing. In contrast, the gliomas, and here a low-grade glioma, it's going to have much more prominent fibrillarity in the background that, that basically refers to those th threads of cytoplasm that you see in the background. The nuclear features are going to be more atypical. You're going to have hyperchromatic nuclei and more nuclear pleomorphism or nuclear atypia. Here's a closer view, and this is a very characteristic smear of a glioma. Now, you're not really going to grade it based on the cytologic features, but you can clearly see that you have pleomorphism you, and that basically refers to variability of the nuclear size and shape. So you can see significant variability. You see nuclear membrane irregularities, hyperchromasia, kind of a clumpy chromatin pattern, and that prominent fibrillarity in the background. Now distinguishing between gliosis and a low-grade glioma on frozens, there are also some key characteristic features. Basically, the non-neoplastic neuropil has structural integrity that is lacking in the gliomas. So the frozen section process introduces much more artifact within the glioma in comparison to the reactive brain or the normal brain. So the picture in the upper right is reactive brain, and in the lower right is a very characteristic frozen section appearance of a low-grade glioma. It has much more of a bubbly background or what I would call sort of a white space background from all that ice crystal artifact. So here's a closer view of the reactive brain. Now notice you do have some ice crystal artifact. You do have some spaces in there, but by and large, the neuropill withstands the frozen section process much better than the glioma. And notice here you can see the reactive astrocytes that are scattered about. Now compare that to this frozen section of a low-grade glioma. The cellularity is higher, there's much more ice crystal artifact, and if you imagine taking away all that ice crystal artifact, those cells would come even closer together. So oftentimes you're actually underestimating the actual cellularity of the lesion because of the ice crystal artifact. Here are three more examples of the typical background that you're going to see on low-grade gliomas. I would say the two on the left are more characteristic one on the right might be slightly more challenging. But if you combine that frozen section pattern of ice crystal artifact 
with the pattern that you're going to see on the smears, you can be pretty accurate at making a diagnosis of a low-grade glioma. Diagnosing a high-grade glioma, high-grade gliomas tend to be more cellular, more pleomorphic, and mitotically active. However, you cannot use cellularity, cytology, or even mitotic figures to make an accurate diagnosis of a high-grade glioma. You generally have to have either necrosis or vascular proliferation. I would say necrosis is the more reliable feature, but vascular proliferation also suffices, but you have to take caution. Let's look at the smear difference between a high-grade glioma on the top and a low-grade glioma on the bottom. The main difference is cellularity. A higher magnification view, you're going to see both increased cellularity, increased atypia, increased hyperchromasia in comparison to the low-grade glioma. But again, these features are not enough. You need to find necrosis. Necrosis in gliomas should appear as coagulative necrosis, meaning that you should see the ghost-like outlines of the dead cells. This, is, this can be seen on smears, but it's a little more difficult. And in my opinion, it's best evaluated on the frozen sections. The more common pitfall that I've seen for non-neuropathologists in this setting is interpreting neuropil as necrosis. Because on a frozen section, it has that kind of amorphous pink appearance to it. But if you look at it at higher magnification, you're not going to see the ghost-like outlines of the cells. Although I don't have pictures of it, another potential pitfall is seeing fibrin associated with blood, which has that amorphous pink appearance to it, and interpreting that as necrosis. But generally, fibrin is going to have more of a filamentous appearance, and you're not going to see the coagulative ghost-like appearance of the dead cells. So here's necrosis on the top, and you can make out what looks like it used to be a cell many of these rounded structures these are the ghosts of the dead cells this is coagulative tumor necrosis and this is neuropil notice that you can still see viable nuclei in here while in the necrosis you're not going to see that many obviously viable nuclei so the concept of vascular proliferation and gliomas is another one that's commonly misunderstood for the non-neuropathologist, it does not refer to an increased number of blood vessels, but rather a tufted glomeruloid-like appearance to the blood vessels. And I would say probably the best definition is a multi-layering of endothelial cells around a vascular lumen. I would say to be cautious in making an interpretation of vascular proliferation on a smear, because if you put on a smear too thick, you're going to get an artifactual sense of vascular proliferation. So I would say in general, I use the smear to establish it, that the lesion is a glioma, and I use the frozen sections to look for the high-grade features, namely necrosis and vascular proliferation. So this is a smear of a glioma. This did turn out to be vascular endothelial proliferation, but again, I would not rely on this appearance on the smear alone higher power view, you can clearly make out that it looks like a blood vessel, but there are more nuclei than you would typically expect. Remember, most of your blood vessels in brain are going to be thin capillaries with a single endothelial cell. Here's a permanent section showing the typical appearance of vascular proliferation. Notice that it's a tufting. So here you can see what looks like blood vessels. You've got red blood cells in the middle, and as it moves into this area of vascular proliferation, it has a much more of a tufted appearance. And if you find the red blood cells, you'll see that there's circumferential multilayering of cells, many of which are endothelial cells, but you also may have tumor cells mixed in. Here is a caveat for both vascular proliferation and necrosis. Pilocytic astrocytoma, which is the most common glioma in children, can have both vascular proliferation and necrosis and still be a grade one tumor. So it's a pitfall. So if you're looking at a pediatric brain tumor and it's posterior fossa, and you see vascular proliferation and necrosis before you make a diagnosis of high-grade glioma, make sure you're not dealing with a pilocytic astrocytoma. And I'll show you some pictures later to help you with that differential. So for adult brain tumors, you're essentially just establishing a diagno diagnosis of glioma, determining whether it's high grade or low grade. 
You don't even have to commit to grade if you don't feel comfortable. You could just say glioma. But for pediatric tumors, you do want to try to recognize the particular subtypes of glioma that have surgical implications. And that is pilocytic astrocytoma and dependymoma. So let's start with pilocytic astrocytoma. These are generally tumors of childhood. They can occur in adults, but by and large, you're going to see them in children. They're most commonly located in the cerebellum, which is the posterior fossa. Classically, they're cystic with an enhancing mural nodule. Not all of them have that classic appearance, but they do by and large enhance because they have an abnormal blood supply. As we had mentioned, they can have vascular proliferation and those sorts of things. So they do allow the gadolinium to get into the lesion, producing contrast enhancement. You need to recognize these because the most important prognostic factor is going to be a complete resection. In fact, a complete resection can be curative. What are the key features when you're evaluating these intraoperatively? On the smears, they have a very prominent hair-like processes, which is why the pilo part of the name comes in. It's the same fibrillary process that you see in adult gliomas, but it tends to be much more prominent. But probably the more reliable feature is going to be the presence of Rosenthal fibers, and I'll show you some pictures in a moment. And then on the frozen sections, the key features is going to be the biphasic growth pattern, meaning you're going to have loose areas and compact areas. Here's a smear of a pilocytic astrocytoma. It's hypercellular. It smears like a glioma. From this magnification, you couldn't tell this from an adult glioma a low-grade glioma or high-grade glioma, all I could say is it looks like a glioma. On higher power examination, again, very prominent fibular processes. You can see them coursing throughout the lesion. That feature can be seen in, in a, an adult diffuse glioma and in a pilocytic astrocytoma. So you want to find Rosenthal fibers. So a Rosenthal fiber refers to these ropey eosinophilic structures here here, here, throughout this lesion. And as you look, you can actually see that they are continuous with these fibular processes, and they represent accumulation of GFAP and other proteins as well, but GFAP is certainly one of the more prominent proteins. Here's vascular proliferation. Now, if this same smear came from an adult, you would be quite concerned that it's a high-grade glioma, but be cautious when you're dealing with a pediatric population. Here's a frozen section. Like most of your gliomas, it's going to have that frozen section artifact, microcystic looking background. But what you want to look for are the Rosenthal fibers. I would say Rosenthal fibers are a key feature, but be, be aware that Rosenthal fibers by themselves are not specific to a pilocytic astrocytoma. So you still need to have the cellularity and the atypia and those sorts of things to establish the diagnosis of a glioma first because Rosenthal fibers can also be seen in the setting of chronic gliosis and in fact it's called pyloid gliosis. This is another reason why you want to put the whole story together, come up with a diagnosis and make sure it correlates with the radiology. Now ependymoma. Realize that ependymomas can occur in the posterior fossa or in the spinal cord I would say the posterior fossa ependymomas, and they can also be supertentorial in, in the cerebrum, but that group of ependymomas is a much different type of tumor than the ones that you see in the spinal cord. They tend to be much more aggressive. They're more likely to have drop metastases and those sorts of things. When you're dealing with this pediatric population of ependymoma, they by and large arise most commonly in the posterior fossa, less common uh, location would be again in the cerebrum, so supertentorial. But we're going to focus here on the posterior fossa example because it's the most common. Imaging shows a circumscribed lesion with varying degrees of enhancement, but generally they're going to have some level of enhancement. And you need to try to recognize these intraoperatively because the surgeon should try to perform a gross total resection or a complete excision because that can be curative. Key features of ependymoma on smears, it looks like a glioma, it's got increased cellularity, 
It may have some glial processes, but it tend not to be nearly as, as prominent as you'll see in a pilocytic astrocytoma or even a, in a diffuse astrocytoma. And they tend to collect around blood vessels, although on smears, that may be a difficult one to appreciate. The key to me is on frozen sections. So on the smears, you're just establishing that it looks like a glioma and that it doesn't really have the prominent fibrillarity of a pilocytic nor does it have Rosenthal fibers, then you're going to turn to the frozen sections and look for the most important finding, which is the perivascular pseudorosette. Here's a smear. It's hypercellular. It has that pattern of a glioma. Higher magnification. You can see it looks like a tumor based on cellularity, based on the presence of nuclear atypia and hyperchromasia. But it's relatively monomorphic, meaning most of the nuclei are relatively similar to the others. You can make out some fibular processes in the background, but not nearly to the degree that you saw in the pilocytic astrocytoma. The key feature is on the frozen section. Now, I would say looking at this, what I see is an irregular distribution of tumor cell nuclei meaning you have more hypocellular, hypercellular areas and less cellular areas, i.e. areas with less nuclei, and those less cellular areas tend to have a blood vessel in the center. I have some better images. Here's another example. Notice that its, its distribution is not even. It's hard to make out pseudorosettes here, but that irregular distribution pattern is, is one clue Another clue is you may see an ependymal lining, so you know that it's growing near the ependyma. And here's a good example of perivascular pseudorosettes. So why are they pseudorosettes? A rosette generally refers to a structure, a lumen that is formed by tumor cells. And that might be a true rosette, like a flexner wintersteiner rosette that you'll see in retinoblastomas or you may see homorite rosettes uh, in, in neuroblastoma or even medulloblastoma. These are pseudorosettes because the luminal structure in the middle is not formed by the, blood, by the uh, tumor cells, but is rather just a blood vessel. So this is a key characteristic feature of these tumors. You can see the blood vessel in the middle, the anuclear zone around it, and then the areas of hypercellularity. This is very characteristic in this setting for an ependymoma. Here's a higher power view. Now you'll notice, especially if you do a GFAP stain, that the tumor cells are sending processes to the blood vessel. And for whatever reason, they tend to maintain this distance between the nucleus and the actual blood vessel, producing the perivascular pseudorosette. Now let's move on from glial tumors to epithelial tumors. And again, you can use a more generic term of epithelioid as opposed to epithelial. But by and large, what we're dealing with here are metastatic carcinomas. These are probably as common, if not more common, than primary CNS tumors. I would say, generally speaking, in an academic practice, that it's roughly 50-50, somewhere in that range. 50% primary brain tumors, 50% metastatic tumors. But as we know, many patients with known primaries and obvious brain metastases are probably not going to get surgery and probably not going to have a pathology specimen. But from our perspective, roughly 50-50. And these can be non-small cell or small cell. They may be adenocarcinomas and these sorts of things. But in general, intraoperatively, you don't really need to differentiate between an adeno and a squam, a cell carcinoma and a small cell. If you feel confident, fine. But by and large, the, dis the distinction intraoperatively is not as critical. It's not like with lung, where they may not do a, you know, a lobectomy if it's small cell. In the brain, they're taking out the tumor irrespective of whether it's small cell or non-small cell because it's causing mass effect. CNS metastases, so I said Roughly, we get about 50% brain tumors are metastatic, 50% are primary. Of that 50% that are metastatic, 50% of those are from the lung. So literally, somewhere in the range of 25% or so of the tumors that we see
are just simply metastatic lung cancer. Most of these are metastatic adenocarcinoma. Less common, much less common, would be a metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. And of course, you get metastatic small cell carcinoma, large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, and in many cases, it may be so poorly differentiated that you can't subtype it. Of the other 50% of brain metastases, it's a pretty broad spectrum. Breast is relatively common. GI is relatively common. I put skin. That's not going to be basal cells and squamous cells. That's by and large going to be metastatic melanoma. Renal cell carcinomas are relatively rare. And if, when you do see them, they tend to be in the bone. And then, of course, miscellaneous tumors or tumors where you can't determine the primary. Key features for intraoperative diagnosis of metastatic carcinomas is that the smears are much more cohesive, they're densely cellular, and the way they spread out is much different than a way a glioma would spread out. Again, due to that cell adhesion aspects of carcinomas. They are epithelioid. Now, to me, epithelioid means cells that have plump, abundant cytoplasm, cohesive properties, generally speaking, and they're going to lack that fibrillarity that you see within your gliomas. On frozen sections, if in the event that you weren't sure whether it was a glioma or a carcinoma, on a frozen section, if there's brain tissue sampled, what you're gonna see is the metastatic tumor is very well circumscribed from brain tissue, and generally the tumor cells are perivascular. So you'll see malignant cells around blood vessels and the surrounding brain generally looks gliotic. So here we compare the smear of a carcinoma on top to the high grade glioma on the bottom. To me, they look very different. The carcinoma is composed of epithelioid cells with abundant cytoplasm that have cohesive properties and I always say that it has this sort of clean white space in the background referring to these areas where you don't see much going on, which you're not going to see in a glioma because the glioma is going to have much more prominent cytoplasmic fibrillarity. So that appearance is very typical of a carcinoma. Melanomas can be a little tricky, but in general they tend to be more dishesive than a typical carcinoma. Maybe you'll find melanin pigment. If you're lucky and you can make this specific diagnosis intraoperatively, again, it's not that important. Common feature with melanoma, if you feel like you need to make the specific diagnosis, is they tend to be hemorrhagic. Remember, if you're ever asked on a, on a board question, the hemorrhagic types of brain tumor, the most common hemorrhagic brain tumors are gonna be melanoma and renal cell carcinoma. And they always throw in that choriocarcinoma, although you rarely ever see that in a neurosurgical specimen. Now back to the comparison, again, the carcinoma on top has cohesive properties. It looks epithelioid. The high grade glioma has more of a glial look to it with prominent fibrillarity in the background. On a frozen section, you see circumscription. So you can see the tumor on the right. This turned out to be an adenocarcinoma and the gliotic brain tissue on the left. And note the sharp border between the two. Here's another example of a metastatic tumor. You have tumor on the right with necrosis. You have reactive brain on the left. And before we move on from epithelial, don't forget about melanoma. These are technically not carcinomas, although they may look as such on intraoperative specimens. They often have an epithelioid appearance. They can be somewhat cohesive, but in my experience, they're more dishesive or discohesive than carcinomas. They tend to be more hemorrhagic. You may find melanin pigment. And um, the patterns, though, can be very similar on both smears and frozen sections. In the event that you're thinking of melanoma, but you don't feel confident making the diagnosis, I would just say metastatic epithelioid neoplasm. You call them on the phone. You tell them the differentials between carcinoma and melanoma and that you have to do stains. Again, they're just doing a gross total resection. So now we move on to meningothelial tumors. So here we're now dealing with the category of tumors that are extraaxial, and this would be the most common by far extraaxial tumor. 
So you'll notice on the imaging, the key characteristic is that you can see this dural tail. So you have a homogeneously enhancing tumor that has this tail of enhancement. And it's that dural tail that gives it away as a dural-based extraaxial lesion. These occur principally in adults. They arise from arachnoid or meningothelial cells. And they produce solid dural-based masses, again, with a dural tail. Enhancement for meningiomas, enhancement patterns, and all that, not important at all because they all enhance. Key features for intraoperative diagnosis. On the smears, you'll see that they're made up of these bland cells. I often say they have football-shaped nuclei. That would be an American football. And they have fine chromatin. They have relatively smooth nuclear membranes. You'll see a small little punctate nucleolus or chromocenter. You may find grooves, pseudo-inclusions. And if you're lucky, you'll see one of the more common features, which is a whorl formation like we see here on the right, where it forms this concentric layering of cells. Not all meningiomas have it, but when you see it, it's pretty characteristic. On frozen sections, you may see a dural attachment. In general, if you see collagen in a brain tumor, it's probably extraaxial, because I can't think of very many intraaxial tumors that have collagen. Again, you may see whorls. And those whorls form these somomatous calcifications over time, which also have that concentric appearance. Here's a smear of a meningioma. It's hypercellular. It tends not to smear all that well, and it has this clumpy appearance to it. From this lower magnification, it would be hard to differentiate this from a glioma. But on higher magnification view, you can see the relatively cohesive nature of the lesion, the lack of fibrillarity around the cells or in between the cells, and these arrangements that we call whorls. Here you can make out, again, these little whorl-like arrangements of cells. Another example, this is the one we saw previously. And on frozen sections, here we can see thick blood vessels, collagen. So you know this is an extraaxial tumor. So if you're approaching it like I do, you're not sure what the imaging findings are, this feature by itself is enough to tell you it's extraaxial. And then again, characteristic whorl formation pins it down as a meningioma. You call it in, say it's a meningioma. Some of the surgeons will ask you, do you see anything atypical or does it look bad? But essentially what they're asking, are there any aggressive features? So meningiomas, now we're, we're talking about intraoperative assessment here, so I'm not getting into subclassification, but meningiomas can be grade one, two, or three. One is 88% of your meningiomas are grade one, technically benign. And I would say around 11%, a little more than that, are grade two. We call those a, atypical meningiomas. And then much less common are your malignant meningiomas, which are grade three. And also they are known as anaplastic meningiomas. But since the vast majority of these are grade one, you're probably just dealing with a grade one in the vast majority of cases. But if they do ask you that, what do you want to look for? Because you're not going to technically grade these things intraoperatively. So the atypical features that are more reliably seen intraoperatively are mainly necrosis and brain invasion, or perhaps on the smears, they have more nuclear atypia than, you used, than you're typically seeing. And the more common nuclear manifestation of a atypical meningioma is the presence of prominent nucleoli. And I threw in here mitotic activity because that is a key thing in grading, but you're generally not going to see them intraoperatively on frozen sections or smears. And in fact, if you do see a mitotic figure on a smear, it's probably going to be a pretty highly mitotically active tumor. So if you see any of those features, you can call it meningioma with atypical features. Does that change their surgery? I think they're more likely to try to get a better negative margin of dura. In fact, they might even send dura for intraoperative assessment for the margin. Here's an example of meningioma. It was relatively bland on the smears but I found 
mitotic figures, and it turned out to be an atypical meningioma. Here's an example of necrosis on an intraoperative specimen. You can see on the right, coagulative tumor necrosis with ghost cells. You don't tend to see that in grade one tumors. It's not sufficient for a diagnosis of atypical meningioma on, grade two, on uh, permanent sections, but it's certainly a, a clue that it's going to be one. So you can note that on a frozen. And brain invasion is defined not just by adherent brain tissue, as we can see here, adherent brain tissue with, with gliosis, but rather permeation into the brain around the Virco Robin spaces, wrapping around brain tissue, causing a histologic reaction in the brain tissue is enough for a diagnosis of brain invasion, which makes it at a minimum grade two. So it isn't a typical feature that you wanna report. Now we move from meningothelial to hematopoietic tumors. This generally it just refers to CNS lymphoma CNS lymphoma occurs in elderly patients, or it could occur in a young patient if it does. It's usually a clue that they're immunocompromised. It could be HIV. It might be they have a solid or, or an organ transplant and they're immunocompromised from medications. These are going to present as enhancing lesions. They can be single, but characteristically they're multifocal. And another characteristic finding is they will shrink and even go away, apparently, go away, although they come back after being given corticosteroids. So if a surgeon suspects CNS lymphoma and they're going in for a biopsy, they're not generally going to put them on steroids before the surgery because they may not get diagnostic tissue. The vast majority, I would say, in my experience, it's 99% plus of CNS lymphomas are diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Over the last, I don't know, five years or so, we've been subtyping these into the germinal center derived versus activated B cell type. And I have seen one case that was germinal center derived, and that was in a patient with CLL, which we assume underwent Richter transformation. But every other CNS lymphoma that I've seen has been a diffuse large B cell lymphoma of the activated B cell type. Now we do have a few examples that we've had over the years of T-cell lymphomas, but that is pretty uncommon. I have also seen a few cases of Hodgkin's lymphoma, but they don't generally present in the brain. The ones that I have seen have been in the, in the dura. And one other note, because I have been asked before, should we do flow cytometry on CNS lymphoma? My answer is it's not necessary because 99 plus percent are diffuse large B cell. They tend not to flow very well. And I don't think you need flow for the diagnosis. But you have to realize that you're talking about intraaxial CNS lymphoma, which is the definition of CNS lymphoma. If it's extraaxial, if it's in the dura, if it's in the skull, it, it could be any type of lymphoma. And in those cases, you do want to do flow cytometry. The key features for CNS lymphoma intraoperatively is they are dishesive or discohesive. They have that kind of dirty background that is referred to as lymphoglanular bodies. It's a very characteristic background. In fact, it's probably one of the more, more important features when I look at these things on smears for being able to make a specific diagnosis of lymphoma intraoperatively. And another common feature in, is, is the presence of nuclear crush artifact. So you get nuclear crush artifact in any of your small blue cell tumors, including metastatic small cell, or even an embryonal carcinoma, embryonal, excuse me, embryonal neoplasm within pediatric population. But in this setting, in, in a situation where you're seeing lymphoglanular bodies and nuclear crush artifact, it's pretty good for a diagnosis of lymphoma. On frozen sections, you're gonna see an angiocentric or a vasocentric growth pattern. So here's a smear. Notice that we've got a dishesive or discohesive population of malignant cells. You've got this dirty background of material and these little structures here which are causing that appearance 
are blebs of cytoplasm that are referred to as lymphoglandular bodies. Here we've got the nuclear crush artifact, which is very common, the lymphoglandular bodies, and the malignant cells that have a lymphoid appearance. They're large, they've got prominent nucleoli, coarse chromatin, and very minimal cytoplasm. On frozen sections, they're growing around blood vessels with a trickling of individual cells into the surrounding brain tissue. But the pattern that you're seeing here is not a pattern of a glioma. Since most of them turn out to be diffuse large B cell lymphoma, for years all we did was a CD3 and a CD20. They're going to be CD20 positive. CD3 will highlight admixed T cells, and that's enough for a diagnosis of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. But in recent years, we are now subtyping them into activated B cell type versus germinal center derived. And we'll have that discussion on uh, another conference. And now we move from hematopoietic to embryonal. Embryonal refers to to me primitive or embryonic like and basically these are primitive blue cell tumors generally presenting in childhood generally presenting in the posterior fossa and the name for this tumor is medulloblastoma so these arise generally in the midline of the cerebellum they're solid they're nodular and they are enhancing and if you see an image like this you're certainly going to have medulloblastoma in your differential, but based on the imaging alone, you couldn't exclude an ependymoma or even a pilocytic astrocytoma with 100% confidence. But the histology certainly gives it away. The key features of, of these tumors is that they are densely cellular, they have a blue appearance, and that blue appearance is due to the cellularity and the relative absence or, or relative minimal amount of cytoplasm within the tumor cells. The tumor cells have oval to elongate nuclei. I often say that they're carrot-shaped, coarse chromatin, scant cytoplasm. You may see nuclear molding, nuclear crush artifact, etc. On the frozens, it's that dense cellularity and that blue appearance that gives it away. In that setting, it's going to be a medulloblastoma. Here's the smear, it's hypercellular, it's discohesive. On high power magnification, they look like malignant cells. They've got, again, these ovoid to elongate or carrot-shaped nuclei, kind of a funny looking carrot, I suppose, with minimal cytoplasm, nuclear crush artifact. It does not have that lymphoglandular body background and it's pretty characteristic in this setting for a primitive blue cell tumor, which we refer to as medulloblastoma. Frozen sections, it may have a nodular pattern, but it's very characteristically the appearance of a blue cell tumor. And here's a clear cut case of a very blue appearing medulloblastoma. So now we move from embryonal, inflammatory, Probably the more common one that you may run into is the cerebral abscess. I would say most of the time they know it's an abscess, but not all the time. And it's because the radiological appearance looks sort of like a malignant neoplasm. It's ring enhancing, meaning it's got that central dark area that's necrosis. And the lesional viable tissue is the enhancing area around it. And that same appearance can be high-grade glioma, metastatic carcinoma, lymphoma, etc. My experience is you can usually tell the difference based on the appearance of the enhancing area. Notice that it's relatively uniform and thin with high-grade gliomas, carcinomas, lymphomas. It's not going to have that thin appearance. It's going to be more nodular and expansile. Um, but it can, be it can be a difficult distinction. These represent bacterial infections that spread to the brain. Generally, they're going to be staphylococci or streptococci. They usually originate from the blood, but they can come directly from the paranasal sinuses. They can be associated with bacterial endocarditis, with congenital heart disease, especially if there's a right-to-left shunt. And again, imaging studies show these ring-enhancing lesions 
they can be and, and are often multifocal. On smears and frozen sections, it's going to be that necro-inflammatory background that's going to be the characteristic findings. You're going to see a lot of neutrophils, a lot of necro-inflammatory debris, and you may even see bacteria. So again, necro-inflammatory debris, this kind of purplish to eosinophilic combo with these dead cells that you can make out as neutrophils on the periphery. And in this case, had abundant bacteria. Now, when they send it in and you see that it's an abscess, you want to remind them just in case that they need to send cultures from the OR. Some surgeons will think that we can do it from the OR, our, OR path lab, but of course it's contaminated and it's best done from the sterile environment of the OR. So this concludes inflammatory and it concludes our discussion. So now you should understand your role in evaluating a brain tumor frozen section. You want to find out is it, is it a craniotomy or stereotactic biopsy so you know what your role is. Remember, for a craniotomy specimen, the only thing that you're going to see that's really going to change the operation is a hematopoietic neoplasm, lymphoma, plasmacytoma, those sorts of things, or potentially that it's non-neoplastic when they expected it to be a neoplasm. But by and large, for all the other tumor types that you're going to see, they're going to try to do a gross total resection. For a stereotactic biopsy, your role is determining that diagnostic tissue is present. You should now know how to differentiate between gliosis and a low-grade glioma based on their characteristic features on smears and frozen sections. You should know the criteria for high-grade glioma intraoperatively, that being coagulative necrosis or vascular proliferation. You should know that it's important for pediatric brain tumors to try to specify that it's a pilocytic astrocytoma or a pendymoma. And I would also throw in there for the medulloblastomas that for that small blue cell appearance, you can make the diagnosis intraoperatively. You should also know the key patterns of metastatic carcinoma, meningioma, lymphoma, and medulloblastoma. And with these skills, you should be able to handle the vast majority of brain tumor frozens. So that concludes this discussion.